at the hinge constraint. You can find this in the effects module under fields and solvers, create hinge constraint. If we go into the options here, you'll see the constraint options. Now it's not the hinge constraint options, it's only constraint options. In the other constraint videos I've done so far, you'll remember that the constraint options are actually the options for all of the constraints. You can change the type of constraint, look right here with the constraint type option, and right now it's the hinge, but if we click this pull down you'll see that you can actually change your constraint type to any of the other constraints, such as nail and pin, both of which we've already gone over. You can click those videos to check those out. So right now we're looking at hinge. Now the difference between hinge and the other constraint types, if I choose nail for example, you'll notice the initial orientation XYZ sliders are grayed out. If I go to pin, the inner penetrate checkbox turns on for pin where it was not on for nail. And if I go to hinge, you'll see I get both inner penetrate as well as the initial orientation sliders available. And also the initial position sliders as well. I'm going to go to edit, reset settings, and you'll notice when I reset the settings it changes the constraint type to nail. So I'm going to go back to hinge and now we get the settings for our hinge constraint. Down here you'll see spring attributes which are all grayed out. That's because we're not using a spring constraint type. If I chose spring, all those spring attributes will become available. But we're using hinge for this video, so I'll go back to hinge, close the spring attributes, and leave it at that. Now we need to have an object that we're going to be applying the hinge constraint to. So let me minimize this. I'll go to create polygon objects and let's use a cone something different. I have a cone in my scene, I'm going to hide the grid. So here's my cone shape. Go back to my hinge constraint options. With my cone selected, I have my default settings with a 000 initial orientation. Set initial position is turned off, and our penetrate is also turned off, and we have our hinge. Up here we have constraint name, and this allows you to name the constraint before you create it. If you don't put anything in this box, it'll just choose a default name for the constraint after you've made it. So let's go ahead and just use all these default settings with no name, constraint name. You can fill it in if you'd like, it doesn't really matter. And with the, with the cone selected, hit create. So first, nothing really obvious happens, but you'll see I'm selecting the ridge, rigid hinge constraint 1. And if I press 4 for wireframe, you'll see what I have this object within my cone. Looks like a line going through the cone. And I can move this around like so. And as I move it away from the cone, you'll notice there's a line stretching from the cone to the hinge constraint indicator. So I can move this around, have this line attaching the cone to the constraint. The cone itself also has this little bitty X. If I select the cone, you'll see the X also highlights, indicating the X is a part of the cone and not the hinge constraint. And that's because when we applied the constraint to the cone, it converts the cone into a rigid body. Rigid bodies are objects within Maya that can have effects applied to them, like gravity and other types of fields, as well as having particles collide with them and so on and so forth. All these dynamic things can be interactive with rigid bodies and when we apply the hinge constraint to the cone it makes it into one of these rigid bodies that we can use. So that means that the cone can be affected by gravity. Right now we don't have any gravity in our scene but we can create some very easily. I'm going to select my cone, go to fields and solvers and choose gravity. The cone turns pink indicating that the gravity that I now select which is that right there, is affecting the cone. So with that all well and good, I need to actually play an animation for the cone to be affected by gravity and thus see the hinge constraint in action. So in order to do that, I need to go to Display, UI Elements, and I'm going to break this off, and let's turn on the Time Slider and the Range Slider. So these are all of our animation playback controls through here. So at frame 1, I can hit Play, We'll see what happens. So immediately you can tell what happens is that the cone being pulled down by gravity can't fall any further than the hinge constraint is allowing it to. 
and the hinge constraint is acting like a pendulum essentially let me get some more frames in here so we're not reverting back to the beginning so quickly let's do like 500 frames or something like that hit rewind and play so you can watch this cone do its thing so the hinge constraint is essentially a hinge like on a door and you can orient the hinge constraint uh, however you'd like of course and gravity and other effects can uh, be applied to the object that is constrained and the hinge constraint will act as an anchor point and the object will swing or react in other such ways as if it's being adhered to into place by this hinge. And that's essentially the basics of how the hinge constraint works. So if you can imagine if you had a actual door shape you could apply these hinge constraints to the side of the door where you would think the door would swing open and closed and as it gets hit by dynamic forces such as a gust of wind or a character colliding through it or whatever you can have that hinge constraint react in a way that the door would bust open or whatever in, uh, in a realistic fashion. So I'm going to go back to fields and solvers create hinge constraint options and so what did we have here? We had a couple of different check boxes here for a set initial position which is the initial position of the hinge constraint itself if you don't check this you can then move the hinge constraint manually which is what I did in this particular case to position it if you have set initial position turned on you can change these sliders and apply the hinge constraint at a particular location if you already know where you want it let's say I delete this hinge choose my cone and with set initial position turned on let's change this to a y value of say 5 hit enter and x value of 5 hit enter so I'm moving the hinge constraint up 5 units and over 5 units and with the cone selected hit create and you'll see that now my hinge, const my hinge constraint automatically becomes positioned over here which if you look at the channel box you'll see is it translate x5 and translate y5 so setting the initial position just kind of places the hinge constraint up here or if you want to you can just move it around yourself I'll delete that go back to my cone fields and solvers create hinge constraint options and then we have our initial orientation by default it's at 0 0 0 we can change that here with the sliders you can also rotate the hinge constraint after the fact to also apply that position that orientation and this is essentially controlling not not to translate XYZ values which is what initial position here does these XYZ values are the translation values but the initial orientation values are the rotation values the rotate values XYZ so if you wanted the uh, uh, hinge constraint to be rotated say 45 degrees over in the y-axis hit create so now you'll see that not only is the constraint moved up here five units up and over but also rotated 45 degrees so when I hit play now that hinge is oriented in this way and not left and right like it was before if I turn on the grid it's more obvious how the uh, object is swinging. So initial orientation, initial position, those are what those two sliders do. They change the translation and rotation values of the hinge constraint. Let's go back to the beginning. I'll select this and delete it again. If I have the object and go to fields and solvers, hinge constraint options, the other one is interpenetrate. So if you had two objects that were applied to the hinge, which you can do, so let's create a new scene and go to create polygon primitives cone so I have my cone here and I'm going to control D to duplicate it make another cone over here I'm going to hide the grid for now so I'm going to select both cones go to fields and solvers create hinge constraint and you can see that I have this hinge constraint created between the two objects and I can move it if I wished up here and I hit play you know, nothing happens yet but I select one of these objects just one and let's go to fields and solvers gravity so now this object is being affected by gravity and I'll place it over here above the other cone and you'll notice that the uh, line was not connecting the cone until I started scrubbing through the animation then the line moved over here to connect with the cone like before 
So with the cone that's being affected by gravity being above the other cone, they're both applied with this hinge constraint, hit play, and that happens, and they kind of collide together. If I select the hinge constraint and turn enter penetrate on, which I can do here in the channel box, hit one, enter, which turns enter penetrate on, rewind and play, and you see now they pass right through each other. So in the hinge constraint options, that is what the inner penetrate checkbox does. It turns on that option to have the have the ob objects that are affected by the constraint pass through each other, or if you keep it unchecked, it, then it does not. So inner penetrate and the setting the initial positions or initial orientations are the only options here in the constraint options window for hinge constraint. So other than that, there is another option you can choose here in the constraint type in the channel box. If you choose this you'll see that you can change it to a directional hinge. It might be getting cut off by the uh, recording space here, but you can also go into the attribute editor, choose the hinge, and here you have constraint type hinge, and you can choose directional hinge here. And the only difference between the two is that the directional hinge will maintain its orientation. So you won't be affected by any other kind of effects that might flip the orientation around by other dynamic forces. The directional hinge will maintain its current uh, orientation and not change. Or you can just choose a typical hinge constraint. So that's pretty much how the hinge constraint works. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned a little bit more about the constraints within Maya. They're pretty fun to work with, especially if you have these for, these dynamic forces and needs for things to be reacting to other uh, gravity and stuff like that. It's fun to work with. If you have any questions or if I missed something, please let me know. Uh, thanks again for watching, and I'll talk to you later.